Hallowed be your name, most high God. Our praise that you are kind, benevolent, and gracious to us. And through Jesus Christ, we have found mercy to cleanse, to purify, to redeem, to adopt, and now to rest secure in the eternal covenant made in the blood of Christ. Happy is the man whose God is the Lord. Well, I have to say that though our numbers are modest, we are a humble church in numerical strength, but God has given to us peace among the brothers and the sisters. The most advantageous condition. How good and pleasant is it for brothers and sisters to dwell together in unity. Now follow my words. We have been with the Galileans. It is a synoptic recording of the earliest gospel spoken by Jesus in approximately A.D. 30. His words and qualifications are dominical and demanding. He requires of his disciples a careful obedience to his words. Already with his half-brother James, we have learned three ways in which we must protect our peace and our purity as a congregation. First, there are to be no sweeping, critical judgments of brothers and sisters, for there is accountability. If we judge harshly, we shall be judged harshly. James even says, quote, Do not grumble against one another, or you will be judged. The judge stands at the door. So together, by the filling of the Holy Spirit, we as a united people have put away criticisms of our brothers and sisters. Next, we were told that unless we showed mercy to the pitiable and to the helpless, our Heavenly Father would not show us mercy. Once again, rigorous discipleship and strict accountability. To think that because we have not shown mercy, our Heavenly Father would not show us mercy certainly must show us the need to be merciful one unto another. Then last week, we learned in a striking statement from Jesus of Nazareth, the premier Galilean. From him we learned that by our words we would be justified and by our words we would be condemned. That our tongue may even be set on fire by Gehenna and that the individual who can control his tongue can control the whole body and is a perfect man. So we are keeping a watch over our lips with charitable assessments of each other, with merciful treatment of each other, with careful words spoken in the community of faith. With all of these things together, we will continue to show and to experience the peace of a gentle flock of Jesus Christ, Providence Church. But this morning, Jesus is going to teach us, James is going to follow him, Jesus is going to teach us of a threat to it all. It too, if violated, his words of discipleship, it too may bring us to liability to the fire of Gehenna. And it is malignant anger 
manifested verbally by the tongue. Jesus equates it all with murder. Specifically, literally, actually, to hate a brother is to be a murderer. In fact, we read in 1 John 3.15, He who hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life dwelling in him. Though written from Ephesus many decades after Jesus' Galilean ministry, John himself a Galilean echoes that word that Jesus speaks from the fifth commandment. Let's read it. Let's look at what he says about anger and its dangers. And then let's make sure that we put away anger and wrath, especially as it might be expressed in the community of Christ, resident here in our humble church. The reading is relatively short. It's Matthew chapter 5, beginning with verse 21, ending with verse 26. Again, we have nothing quite like it in our friend Paul. It is the earliest teaching of the earliest teacher, the prophet sent from God, Jesus of Nazareth. Verse 20, 21. You have heard that the ancients were told, you shall not commit murder. And whoever commits murder shall be liable to the court. But I say to you, that everyone who is angry with his brother shall be guilty before the court. And whoever says to his brother, you good for nothing, shall be guilty before the Supreme Court. And whoever says, you fool, shall be guilty enough to go into the fiery hell. Therefore, if you are presenting your offering at the altar... And there remember that your brother has something against you. Leave your offering there before the altar and go. First, be reconciled to your brother. Then come and present your offering. Make friends quickly with your opponent at law while you are with him on the way so that your opponent may not hand you over to the judge, the judge to the officer, and you be thrown into prison. Truly I say to you, You will not come out until you have paid up the last cent. And we ask always that God would add to the reading of these dominical words from Christ his own blessing. So, others had heard, the first verse tells us, others had heard since ancient times from antiquity, The Torah had been read to them. And whether from Exodus 20 or Deuteronomy 5, the two listings of what we call the Ten Commandments are located there. And when the ancients, the forebears in the Old Covenant, heard read in the synagogue the Torah, they had heard it said that you shall do no murder. It's important for us to remember that the murder that is referred to here is premeditated murder. It is not manslaughter, which does take a life, but the individual did not premeditate an accidental death. And so the Bible provided cities of refuge for ones who had committed manslaughter. And the elders of the city were to protect one who fled to the city of refuge. That's not under consideration here. What is under consideration here is probably the ultimate story in all the Bible of fratricide, the killing of one's brother. And that takes us, of course, to Genesis and to the account of Cain and Abel. So we say this, when the rabbis talked about 
the dangers of anger, the backdrop for that discussion was more often than not Genesis chapter 4 and the taking of innocent life by the bloodshed in Cain's murder of Abel. And it is that which narrates John's words in 1 John 3.15 that whoever hates his brother is a murderer and you know that no murderer has eternal life dwelling in him. So the backdrop as individuals hear this first, it is the first teaching of the Sermon on the Mount, and it is therefore considered to be by many most important and significant for the life of the disciples' community. Here, he simply says that in antiquity, the ancients heard the Torah read from Exodus 20 or Deuteronomy 5, and what you heard, says Jesus, is that the one who commits murder, as defined by the Hebrew word, which means a premeditated act of wrongful anger, the individual who does that Jesus says, you have heard, shall be liable to the court. And all of us here this morning would likely give assent to that teaching. It's found in Deuteronomy 16, 18, where the Bible tells us that judges were appointed in cities to litigate legislation that prevented murder. So when Jesus says those who commit murder will be liable to the court according to the ancients, he's referring to provisions such as Deuteronomy 16, 18, where judges are appointed to litigate homicide. And we find also that from the background not only of Genesis 4, but also from the background of Numbers 35, 31, that murder was a capital offense. In other words, one who shed blood by the courts and by the execution, executioner, his blood would be shed, life for life. Numbers 35, 31, but other places in the Torah as well. And so we find Jesus citing this to what must have been, in some ways, an enraptured audience. Yes, he says, it is true. From Deuteronomy, from Numbers, from the Torah, from Exodus, from Deuteronomy, all of these things conspire together to tell us that one guilty of premeditated murder was liable to the court and liable to a capital punishment. You have heard that. But I say to you, when Jesus says, I say to you, he is affirming his authority as a prophet sent from God, yes. But he is not replacing the Torah, nor is he differing from the intent of the Torah, but he is amplifying, he is broadening and deepening the teaching of the fifth commandment that you shall do no murder and he's deeping in it to mean that anger lies in the category of murder. That not only one who murders shall be liable to the court but as you read here I say to you everyone who is angry with his brother shall be guilty before the court. There is an equation of embryonic murder, what we would say developmental murder, foundation, the, the, the beginning of, of the life of anger within a human soul, the embryonic anger, that an individual who has that embryonic, that malignant anger, 
is guilty before the court just as one was guilty when one committed premeditated murder. That, in a sense, Jesus is saying that what precipitates murder, malignant anger within the heart, especially as expressed, as we'll see in the next verse, especially as expressed verbally, malignant anger expressed verbally is of a piece, is of a kind with murder itself. And that that condition of malignant anger is not only a threat, but it makes the one who holds on to that malignant anger guilty before the court. Now I need to mention something about the word court. Court is literally the word judgment. And so in some of your Bibles, remember I'm faced with perhaps four or five different translations in the laps of those who are here this morning. So some will say court and some will say judgment. But the word judgment or court amount to liability to judgment. If you're subject to the court, you're liable to the guilt of the judgment. And Jesus equates that malignant anger with premeditated murder and says that although the ancients said that you would be liable to the court of judgment for premeditated murder, I say to you, you shall be guilty before the court of malignant anger. Now I have a textual matter that I need to mention. It may be that some of you have the authorized version, the King James Version. And it says in that translation, it says, those of you who are angry without cause. That word without cause is a matter of textual criticism. By that I mean that we have some reliable manuscripts that are older, and those older reliable manuscripts add those words without cause. Earlier manuscripts that are used by newer translations, those older manuscripts do not have the word without cause. Perhaps much of this has to be speculation because we weren't present to know. But it appears that perhaps zealous scribes recognized that Jesus himself on occasion became angry. You can look at Mark 3, 5 and see that he was grieved at the hardness of his opponent's heart and he was angry. And we call that righteous anger. Well, because of this, and to protect the integrity of Jesus' sinlessness, some zealous scribes apparently wrote in the margin without cause. And as those manuscripts were recopied and used, the words without cause made their way from the margin or from the top, made their way into the text to protect the legitimacy of righteous anger and especially the sinless conduct of Jesus. But what many textual critics believe is that there never should have been those words in the first place and that the earliest manuscripts dating back to the fourth century do not have that. So some of you have Bibles with that, some of you have Bibles without that, and some of you uh, perhaps have those words in the margin. In any case, I hope that explanation tells you why the words are there if they are there in your version. But the point is not missed either way. Jesus is astounding those who hear that complementary to what the ancients heard is his own elaboration of the fifth commandment that malignant anger, especially expressed verbally, makes one liable to the court of judgment just like actual homicide does. That's the category 
in which Jesus places anger that for many Christians is a non-concern. He then goes on to say this. He uses two different words. The first in the New American Standard is translated good for nothing. Or in your version, it may have raka, R-A-C-A. What scholars tell us about that word is this, that raka is a loan word, a word borrowed from Aramaic. It itself comes across in the Greek alphabet as raka. And apparently, according to those who work with words, apparently it means empty-headed, somewhat like we call an individual a blockhead or airheaded. And the New American Standard has chosen to render it, you good for nothing. But what I'm concerned about is the breadth of meaning of the word. It can be disparaging or it can be abusive. So the lexical range of this word is rather broad. It can mean a disparagement of an individual or it can mean abuse of an individual. But whatever the case may be, it is inappropriate speech for a disciple of Christ to call a brother or a member of the covenant community an idiot or stupid or good for nothing or empty headed or a blockhead. All of these abusive epithets are forbidden to the disciple of Christ when speaking of a member of the covenant community because it reflects embryonic murder. So, the next statement that Jesus makes is, he says, you good for nothing shall be guilty before the Supreme Court. There seems to be a graduation here, a hierarchy. First of all, it's individuals speaking against then it's an individual verbalizing with good for nothing, and that individual is liable to the Supreme Court. It's literally Sanhedrin. Some of your translations probably have that. But in other words, a epithet attached to one's anger, a verbal statement of calling an individual an idiot or stupid, that individual is liable not only to the court, but to the highest court in the land of Judah or in the country of Judea. So the Jewish highest court would take up the case of an individual who would defy Jesus' warning and call a brother or a sister stupid or an idiot or you good for nothing. Then Jesus uses a word which some believe is stronger, the word fool. And he says this, if you are angry enough to call a member of the covenant community, male or female, if you are angry enough to call a member of the covenant community a fool, you are in danger, Jesus said. You are liable to or subject to the Gehenna of fire, literally. And of course, this is eternal punishment. This is the place outside of Jerusalem, the Valley of Hinnom, where it became metaphorically a picture of the place of the damned after the last judgment. And Jesus is saying this, if your anger is such that you would call a brother or sister a fool, you're in danger of hellfire. Now, what this does, it is of a piece it is categorically precisely what we have seen in the three previous examples of the Galileans of the early 30s A.D. Jesus, his half-brother James, whom he saw after his resurrection and who picked up the Galilean idiom and began to use it in his teaching. Where we read James, we often read almost verbatim the teaching of Jesus. And the teaching of Jesus here is found in James where he says, 
let every man be quick to hear, slow to speak. Remember, let your nay be nay and your yea be yea, and slow to anger. An aphorism of wisdom from James as he combines a readiness to hear, a reluctance and a slowness to speak, and a slowness to come to the point of anger in your life. That anger puts you in jeopardy, ultimately, of the fire of Gehenna. Now, two interpretations here that will clear this up and we'll move on to new territory and explore the next two verses. There are two perspectives on what I have referred to as graduated levels of inappropriate speech and conduct. So some interpreters read this as Jesus saying, as I've said, if you speak against the brother, you're liable to the court. If you go beyond that and call him good for nothing, you're liable to the Sanhedrin. And if you go beyond that and call him a fool, you are liable to the fire of Gehenna. And so interpreters, some of them read and see that as graduated exhibitions of anger with graduated punishments. So each one is incrementally harder and more harsh. The harsher the anger, the harsher the punishment. And that may be correct. It comes to mind when you read it that that is plausible. However, there is another interpretation of that in which the three are deemed as relatively the same thing, but given three times for emphasis. So it's not an intent, according to this view, it's not an intent to measure graduated conditions of anger. It's simply what we call repetition for emphasis. That being liable to the court, that being liable to the Sanhedrin, that being liable to the Gehenna of hell, of fire, that all three of these are simply different ways of saying the anger has resulted in abusive speech and the condition that would result in the abusive speech is so dangerous that that individual, whether calling one raka or whether calling one a fool or whether speaking evil of a brother, in those three cases, regardless of the, the incremental interpretation, it's simply Jesus' intensity of emphasis in which he underlines the gravity of what anger causes in the covenant community and the liability to judgment that anger necessitates. So when I read this, I've got to take a, a deep breath because it's saying to me, anger with a brother or a sister is off limits. It's not enough to refrain from striking a brother or a sister. It's not enough to refrain from harsh words about a brother or a sister. It's not enough to refrain from premeditated murder, what I must refrain from is the state of malignant anger, especially that exhibits itself in critical speech and harsh speech against a brother or a sister. Jesus is saying to his disciples, just like he told us not to judge one another and to show mercy to one another, and that our words would justify or condemn us, now he's telling us anger is off limits. And so what modern pop psychology views as sometimes healthy is strictly forbidden by Jesus. Now let's look at what comes next because I think there are some who read this and wander away from the point that Jesus is making all the way through. He says this, and we're alerted by the very first word in verse 23. Therefore, in other words, because 
Calling your brother or sister a fool makes you liable to the fire of Gehenna. Therefore, let me tell you this. Because of the seriousness of nurturing anger, let me tell you this. It's not just liability to the court and reproof for name-calling and the fire of Gehenna for an epithet such as fool. Therefore, because those things are true, let me give you an example of how critical and crucial the potency of unleashed anger is in the covenant community. And he says this, If you are presenting your offering at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your offering there before the altar and go. First, be reconciled to your brother, then come and present your offering. Now, what Jesus is using as an illustration is one of the highest privileges of Christian discipleship, or especially in Matthew, where we have a strong emphasis on the old covenant and the ways and, and Jewish ways, the ways of Judaism. One of the highest acts of one who lived in the environs of Judea and could make themselves uh, close to the temple, in other words, geographically close to the temple, one of the, one of the highest acts that an individual could perform was to bring a gift, it may be translated gift in your Bible, or an offering, more commonly translated offering, is to bring a gift or to bring an offering to give to God at the temple. This was the apex of Jewish piety, along with almsgiving and, and some other uh, details that Jesus gives elsewhere. But here, plainly he is depicting an individual in the covenant community who is bringing a gift uh, for a sin offering, for a burnt offering, for a thank offering, for a free will offering, for a votive offering, all the Levitical offerings that we have in the Torah, this individual is bringing one to the altar. But as he is presenting his gift to the living God, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one, the unique act of Jewish worship of the one and only supreme God, he remembers, that is the worshiper, the member of the covenant community, the brother in the discipleship, the brother in the disciples, in the disciple relationship, he remembers that his brother has a legitimate grievance against him. That is the intent of what Jesus is saying. Reading it speedily without a little background, uh, it appears a little obscure precisely how that's running. So allow me to uh, give that understanding to you that is intended. The individual, the brother who is bringing the offering, he, ha he has actually offended another brother or sister in the covenant community. And he remembers, as he is presenting his gift, he recalls that. All of a sudden, brought to his mind, is an awareness that he has offended one within the covenant community. Jesus says the first thing to do is not to continue the act of worship. In other words, what Jesus is going to counsel is of such importance that it interrupts one of the highest acts of Jewish piety available to Jews in the Holy Land. What Jesus is going to say is so important that he must leave his gift at the altar and go to his brother and be reconciled. Why? Two, two answers to that. The first is apparent and simple. 
he recognizes that he is guilty of an offense and Jesus, especially in Matthew chapter 18 for an example, Jesus has always taught his disciples to go to an offended brother and to make things right. So certainly this is in, in the forefront of what Jesus is saying. You have offended a brother, you are to go to the brother and reconcile with that brother. But in the context, it appears to mean something quite different. Though it is true, he is to reconcile the offense with his brother. The danger that he has brought his brother to a state of anger is great. And because anger is so damaging and so libeled by Jesus that the individual whom he has offended is likely angry and his offense has caused a brother to have malignant anger against him and thus he has put his brother in harm's way. And because he has put his brother in harm's way by angering him by way of offense, rather than continue the act of giving to God, interrupt that act, leave the gift at the altar, go, and then Jesus says, first reconcile yourself to your brother. Why? Because if you have made him angry, you have brought him into a state of vulnerable jeopardy. And because he is in a state of anger, he is liable to the court, and he's liable to the Sanhedrin, and he's liable to the fire of Gehenna, and you have occasioned his anger by your act of effrontery, and rather than allow a brother to stay in that state of anger, however weak he may be, you are to go and to reconcile with that brother, not only to make right the offense, but to remove the cause of anger from your brother. Jesus is saying that anger is so dangerous and may make one liable to the fire of Gehenna that because that is true, leave the offering at the altar and because of your responsible, or in this case, irresponsible act has caused him anger, remove that cause of anger lest you cause your brother to stumble and sin. So reconciliation is once again brought to the fore in the teachings of Jesus, but the reconciliation is not only to remove the offense, but to remove the cause of anger that may cause further offense and endanger the life and judgment of the one who has been offended. So Jesus is placing the highest responsibility on us not to offend our brothers and sisters. Why? Because they may be prone to anger, and if they are prone to anger, they are liable to the judgment. And rather than place a brother or sister in that position of, of, of jeopardy, rather than continue with your act of worship, interrupt that no matter how important it must be. There's something more important. Go and reconcile with your brother, remove the cause of anger, and take away your brother's liability to judgment for anger against you because of your offense. So Jesus is coming at this from a uh, relationship perspective, but also highlighting in his teaching here the dangers that are occasioned by provoking someone to anger. It's interesting that we have somewhat of the same teaching, although we're dealing with Galileans. Paul says children, I mean parents, fathers, don't provoke your children to wrath. Don't be so excessive in your discipline that you provoke anger instead of correction because that anger brings the child into a position of vulnerability, ultimately liability to judgment. 
So there's somewhat of a similar thought there in Ephesians chapter 6. But what Jesus is teaching here is let's not put a stumbling block in our brother's way to become angry in a, at us because of thoughtless misdeeds toward them. If we do, the first thing we need to do is to go to them and make it right and then make sure that the cause of anger has been rectified and the relationship is reconciled. Now the last thing, the last two verses. And this is a little surprising, but it shows how far-reaching these kinds of things are in the mind and thought and teaching of Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus says, not only do I want you to leave a preeminent act of worship and be reconciled to your brother rather than cause him anger. If you have an opponent at law, this does not necessarily refer to a brother. Because of the last word of verse 26, it appears to be a case in which the brother is indebted to an opponent, an adversary in some translations, an individual is indebted to another who may not at all be a believer. But reconciliation with an adversary is so important that Jesus says this, rather than allow the matter of your indebtedness to your opponent to go to court, if you go to court, you may be, as we've seen all the way through the passage, liable to the judgment of the court, assessed a monetary penalty, and if that monetary penalty is assessed against you, you may be handed by the judge over to the officer or the bailiff, and the officer and the bailiff may put you in prison. And then Jesus says with solemnity in the last verse, truly I say to you, you will not come out of there until you have paid up the last cent. And a cent is two mites. So it's the next to smallest coin in the coinage of uh, the day. So Jesus is saying this, reconciliation is so important that not only should you make it with one whom you have offended and perhaps brought to a place of anger, but even in a secular debt relationship, if you are indebted to an individual who is going to take you to court, so serious is that that you make friends with him on the way to court. And the idea is be reconciled to that individual. In a sense, we have a similar practice where individuals settle out of court, whatever the, the legal case may be. They, they settle out of court. I recognize sometimes that is done Wrongly, I recognize sometimes that is not the appropriate course. But Jesus is saying, as you are on your way to the court, recognize the seriousness of not being reconciled. And the consequences of not being reconciled are that you may stay in prison until you have paid the last penny in our language. So rather than risk being incarcerated until you can play pay the last penny, reconcile with your opponent at law while you're on your way to court. And one would think that Jesus would, restri would restrict his argumentation to the Torah and to the earlier parts of this message of Jesus Christ. But Jesus takes it to the extreme that reconciliation is so appropriate for a disciple that even in a secular matter, which may land one in the judgment of the court, it is better to be reconciled than to risk imprisonment because you've been unwilling to reconcile. So he's underscoring the fact that not only is reconciliation important between estranged brothers and sisters, but reconciliation is important even with those we have with whom we may have disagreements, monetary or otherwise, and that those should be settled in an amicable matter so that you are not liable to the consequences of being unreconciled and end up serving the consequences in prison, in this case, in prison. 
So our Lord's counsel goes so far that we can boil it down to this. Anger is a danger that is categorically in the, under the subject thematically of murder. That we are to refrain from malignant anger which makes us liable to the court. And that excessive levels of anger, unrepented of and continued in using epithets and language to harshly describe one who has angered us, render us liable to being judged for that. And we'll leave it at that. And if we have offended someone and brought them to the point where they are angry with us, It is our Christian duty to go to that individual and remove the cause of anger by righting the wrong that you have done against them. And lastly, out here in the in in the in the wicked world in which we all must live and do business, even there, reconciliation is is appropriate, rather than to to be subjected to the judgment's liability and guilt of a secular court. So adding to the three previous teachings of the Galileans, Jesus gives us a comprehensive statement of why we must keep anger out of our lives and turn from it lest we be liable to judgment. Let us pray. Father, we uh, tend to view anger uh, as uh, a private and mild indulgence of sin, but your words make us fearful of harboring sinful notions and especially of uttering epithets of harshness and abuse to others who have angered us, to calling them names. And so as your disciples, we are to put away anger and not indulge in abusive name-calling. And even in our relationships with the world, we are to do our best to effect reconciliation rather than dwell with an individual who is angry at us and may cause us one day to be liable to the court. We pray that we may be helped and the peace and purity of your church would be aided as we consider these things. In the name of Jesus, amen.